Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa podcast. I'm your host, Andy. Last episode, we covered the events of the Third Anglo-Ashanti War up through 1873. The Ashanti army, led by the general Aman Kwasha IV, successfully invaded much of the British Gold Coast, but failed to capture the important strategic ports and supply lines. When British reinforcements arrived, the Ashanti, now suffering from outbreaks of disease and chronic supply problems, were forced to retreat back across the Pra River. Season 3, Episode 24 The Third Anglo-Ashanti War Part 2 Kumasi in Flames As 1873 waned into 1874, it was clear that the Third War with the British was not going well for Aman Kwasha. His armies, while intact, were demoralized and poorly supplied. Many of them hadn't eaten in days by the time that they withdrew back to Ashantiman. Meanwhile, the British army in the Gold Coast continued to get stronger. The main army, encamped at the town of Prasso, were far better fed than their Ashanti enemies. Garnet Wolseley, the British commander, arranged for massive shipments of food for his soldiers, including a variety of meats, grains, and cheeses. Their ammunition coffers were full, and the troops' morale was high. To pass times, regiments were allowed to put on plays, flirt with local women, and even keep pets, which included, for two divisions, a chimpanzee and a baby crocodile that lived in a bathtub. When you compare the state of these two armies, one goofing around with baby crocodiles and putting on play, and the other struggling to meet basic food needs for their own soldiers, it really emphasizes the disparity when it came to supply needs that these two armies faced. It was clear by now that there was no way that the Ashanti could win this war, at least not in the way they had originally envisioned. In the waning days of 1873, the capture of Elmina was, at this point, a fantasy. However, in December of 1873, the Ashante Manjiamu, with the consent of Ashante Hene Kotikakari, made an offer of peace to the British general, Wolseley. This offer was essentially a concession, a one-to-one -one reflection of Wolseley's demands in the last episode. Amon Kwasha's army withdrew north of the Pra, the missionary hostages were released, and Kakri even began drafting a recognition of the British ownership of Almina. It was an embarrassing moment for the Ashanti. Sure, they had experienced some give and take with the British before, but this is the first time that the Ashanti were ever truly and unquestionably beaten by the British. It was a humiliation to do so, but Kakari had to admit defeat. However, when news reached Wolseley that the Ashanti were seeking peace, he dismissed their offer out of hand. In Wolseley's view, the Ashanti had sternly rejected the peace offer when they had been winning, and now that the shoe was on the other foot, they were expecting to receive the same relatively generous deal? Yeah, right. Now, at this point, most of the British colonial government were more than happy to accept the deal. The Ashanti were giving the British exactly what they had asked for, with no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Plus, what exactly more could Wolseley possibly hope to achieve in this war? Driving the Ashanti out of the colony was one thing, but actually crossing the Pra River? No British army had crossed offensively into Ashanti territory since, you guessed it, Charles McCarthy, and everyone remembered how that turned out. So, unless Wolseley wanted his head hollowed out and used as a cup, it would be smart for him to just take the win. But he didn't. By December, Wolseley had clearly developed an idea of how to solve the British problems with the Ashanti. He would destroy the Ashanti Empire and burn their capital city to the ground. In Wolseley's words, the burnt ruins of Kumasi would serve as a stamp on the Ashanti country, ensuring that future generations would dare not oppose the British. Wolseley's original invasion plan was ambitious and, dare I say, quite over-engineered. You see, one of the main factors that have worked in the Ashanti's favor in previous conflicts and had even strongly influenced Aman Kwasha's strategy in this war was the poor state of roads in southern Ghana. Now, we did a premium episode on Ashanti road networks a while back. The Ashanti Empire hosted an impressive system of paved paths, designed to aid in the rapid deployment of troops in wartime and for ease of mercantile travel during peacetime. Fantemon, on the other hand, had basically nothing in terms of transportation infrastructure at the time. Besides a few small roads near the coast, the region was essentially bare of viable roads heading north. And that makes sense. Not only did the vast majority of mercantile activity for the Fanti take place on the coast anyways, but all that an extensive road network would have done for the Fanti is to help the Ashanti conquer their cities faster. So, even since the days of the old Fanti Confederacy, the roads in Fantemon had pretty much always been in varying states of ruin. Aman Kwasha had to carve his own paths for his invasion force, which he then subsequently destroyed during the Ashanti retreat. 
Shipping the necessary supplies for an invasion of Ashantemon was obviously impossible on these ruined paths, so Wolseley came up with an ambitious plan of his own. Build an entire railroad. The proposed railroad would stretch from Cape Coast to Abra, and then on to Prasu, followed by a telegraph line. They would lay rails and wires behind them, ensuring a constant stream of efficient supply and a ready line of communication. Ready to begin groundwork, Wolseley shipped to Cape Coast several miles worth of rail, as well as a coal-powered tractor to assist in laying them. This was a terrible plan. The hilly terrain of southern Ghana meant that laying a railroad was much more difficult and tedious than Wolseley had expected. The engineers who had arrived in Cape Coast to lay the rails were also frequently incapacitated by malaria. Early groundwork on the project started not long after Wolseley's arrival, and a few months later, it had barely progressed at all. So, the idea was abandoned. The miles of railway just sort of laid around in Cape Coast Harbor, while the steam tractor was instead put to an alternative use of disembarking supply crates from incoming ships. Wolseley instead settled on a less ambitious but more realistic strategy. He would have his soldiers follow a similar strategy to the one that Amon Kwasha had used. They would carve out paths on their own and then receive supplies on baggage caravans. This strategy was risky. What if, like during the first Anglo-Ashanti War, these caravans were ambushed or otherwise cut off from their invading column? This could be another in Zamanko waiting to happen. Regardless, Wolseley pressed forward with his risky new plan. By New Year's Day of 1874, he and 10,000 men macheted their way up to Prasu. And, for the first time since 1823, a foreign invader entered Ashantiman. This was the start of the second phase of the Third Anglo-Ashanti War known in Chui as the Sagrenti War, this coming from a mispronunciation of Garnet Wolseley's first name. Despite the invasion, Kakari and the Ashanti Manjiamu did not abandon their efforts to make peace. As Wolseley's army creeped into Ashanti territory, Kakari continued trying to negotiate with the general. Wolseley responded to these peace offers by making demands that he knew were far too steep for the Ashantihani to realistically meet. Remember, according to private correspondence, Wolseley had already long since made up his mind. There was only one way that this war would end, with the complete destruction of Kumasi. In his personal letters, Wolseley expressed that anything short of complete destruction of the Ashanti capital, in his view, would be a failure. In his personal writings, Wolseley wrote that it was necessary to turn Kumasi into a symbol of destruction, to inform all African powers of what would happen if they crossed the British. Basically, at this point, Wolseley's motives had expanded well beyond the considerations of the Third Anglo-Ashanti War, or even the Ashanti altogether. This was about making a continent-wide example. Amon Kwasha, for his part, had not been idle. While Wolseley prepared his invasion force, Amon Kwasha spent his time evacuating the civilian population out of southern provinces, readying the area to become a battleground. Meanwhile, in Komasi, Kakari scrambled to raise more troops, and assemble more supplies for his tattered army. Even though he held out hope for a peaceful resolution, he would make sure that his army would be ready if war had to continue. However, regardless of what happened next, there was a consensus among Kakari and other members of the Kotoko and Ashanti Manshamu that whoever would lead the Ashanti armies, it wouldn't be Amon Kwasha. By January, any goodwill for Amon Kwasha and Komasi had long since evaporated. Under his oversight, the invasion of Cape Coast and Elmina turned into enormous failures. Was this entirely his fault? Well, probably not, but in times like this, it's nice to have a scapegoat. Alan Quash's fate was sealed when he returned to Komasi and insisted that he had the perfect plan to defeat the British. A surprise, full frontal attack. At this point, I can just imagine everyone rolling their eyes at him. Like, dude, didn't you already try that twice and fail both times? What makes you think the third time will work out? And this was the attitude that most of the Ashanti Manchiamu took to Aman Kwasha's suggestion. However, he did still have a few supporters. Notably, the king of Juaben, a man by the name of Asafo Aji, took a liking to the frontal attack plan. And, well, maybe Aman Kwasha's idea wasn't as ridiculous as it sounded. After all, the last time he had executed this kind of attack, the actual strategy had worked as intended, but was sabotaged by a severe gunpowder shortage. Aji, however, commanded a fresh army of around 10,000 men. Compared to the main Ashanti force, these men were relatively well supplied. Most of them had fought in the much lighter front around Accra, if they had even fought in the initial offensive at all. 
Not to mention, the British at this point were well aware of Ashanti encirclement tactics and had adapted their own tactics accordingly. So, if Amun Kwasha could execute a successful frontal attack with troops equipped with actually fully powdered guns that could kill people and not the quarter-filled muskets that caused welts when they hit their mark, he could catch the British off guard. But the Ashanti Shamu and Kakari chose to ignore this plan. In their eyes, Amun Kwasha had already proven himself incompetent. For a while, the most popular strategy at the meeting was a fairly conservative one. The Ashanti would make their defensive stand in the Adansi province. This area was much more hilly than the rest of Ashanti territory, so it seemed likely that the British would struggle to lug supplies up the steep terrain. If the Ashanti could set up some kind of fortification, these hills would prove to be a tough nut to crack. This idea was popular among the Ashanti Manshamu at first, but ultimately fell out of favor, largely due to the influence of one man. This man was the elderly, formerly retired general, Amasoa Nkwanta. Nkwanta was about 70 years old in 1874, and looked the part. Apparently, he possessed a long gray beard that stretched down to his chest, giving him the appearance of a West African Gandalf. Nkwanta was a household name for successful reforms that he had introduced into the Ashanti army during the rule of Kwako Joa. He pioneered the use of smaller, more autonomously operating units, as well as implementing a new technique of musket volley fire into the Ashanti military. This technique consisted of a unique assembly line-esque reloading system, in which soldiers would pass their spent firearms back to a pair of Adonko standing behind them in the heat of battle, one of whom would reload the weapon while the other repowdered it. And Quanta had survived Kakari's military purge by, well, being retired during the height of unrest during Kakari's early rule. However, he had returned to action after his beloved nephew was killed during the early skirmishes of the war. Unlike Amun Kwasha, Nkwanta was very respected and very charismatic. After a brief meeting, Nkwanta convinced the Ashanti Manshamu to make him the new leader of the army, which wasn't hard when you consider how fed up everyone was with Amun Kwasha, and elevated him to the position of Konti Hene. Amun Kwasha would still command his own smaller army as an officer, but he was now subservient to his new boss. We'll be back after a quick break. At this very moment, you are faced with a choice. Do I continue doing what I have been my entire life, or do I tap the listen now button and take the red pill? Peter and I will be waiting for you on the other side. When Nkwanta took over as Kontihene, he radically diverged away from the Ashanti Manshamu's war plans. Rather, he would formulate a plan that emulated similar Ashanti victories in the past. Inspired by two of the Ashanti's greatest victories, Ose Tutu's war with Danjira and Ose Bonso's war with the British, Nkwanta decided to stick with the strategy that had traditionally worked well for the Ashanti. He would allow the British to enter Ashantiman uncontested, wait for them to overextend and move too far in, ambush and encircle them, cut off their supply lines, and then obliterate the isolated British column. This plan convinced the Ashanti Manchiamu, as well as Kakari himself. So, the newly demoted Amun Kwasha was ordered to withdraw from the Adansi Hills. However, there was one person who was not convinced by Nkwanda's new plan, the King of Juaben. Aji had believed that this plan was far too tepid and predictable. The British would obviously see it coming. It was the same thing that the Ashanti had done every other time they'd been invaded in the past. Frustrated by the government's willingness to endorse this conservative and tepid strategy, Aji decided that his own personal army would not participate in this foolishness. So, rather than joining the rest of the Ashanti army, his 10,000 well-equipped soldiers under his command stayed put in Joabin. The British invasion plan was fairly conventional. Two smaller columns to the west would march northeast, while the largest column, led by Wolseley himself, would march directly north. They would all converge on the singular target of the campaign, the city of Komasi. If they expected fierce fighting, however, the British and their allies were sorely disappointed. As they marched through the Adansi Hills, they found no enemy soldiers and no people at all. Most of the region had been evacuated, so even the civilian population consisted only of a few dozen stragglers. In his personal log, Wolseley noted that this part of the invasion was more like a pleasant tour through the countryside than a military operation, 
He speculated that the Ashanti had recognized their imminent defeat and realized that putting up a fight was a waste of time. With the British plunging deeper into Ashanti territory, Nkwanta patiently prepared for his counterattack. His first task was to repair the tattered Ashanti army back into something resembling a suitable fighting force. He released soldiers who were severely wounded or suffering from malaria or malnutrition from his army, and raised new levies to replace them. This decision significantly shrunk the Ashanti force, but improved the health and quality of men available to fight. To solve the problems of chronic food shortages, he requisitioned an enormous amount of food from local farms. However, his most unusual change to the army was intended to improve his soldiers' plummeting morale. He turned to the Islamic faith. The traditional Ashanti religion had always played an immense role in maintaining high spirits in Ashanti military ranks, convincing the soldiers that they were backed by the spirit of warfare, Tano. However, with the war clearly going poorly, many soldiers began to lose faith in the power of the Abosom, including Tano himself. So Nkwanta chose to move in a new direction. To bolster his men's morale, he began handing out small lockets to his soldiers. Each one contained a piece of paper featuring a verse from the Quran, which the general claimed would protect his soldiers from bullets. Did Nkwanta sincerely believe that this would happen? Maybe, maybe not, but it did do wonders to improve his men's morale. The British had advanced through Adansi by the end of the month, and now were on a road leading directly to Komasi. And Guanta decided that he would make his stand at the last major city on the road before the exurbs of Kumasi, the important Kotoko city of Bechwai. And Guanta decided to make his stand at the last major city on the road before Kumasi, the important Kotoko city of Bechwai. He prepared for battle carefully. To ensure that there were no British spies or scouts in the surrounding area, Nkwanta hired a small army of civilian police to patrol the outskirts of town and report any suspicious activity to him. The plan made sense, but ultimately failed. On January 29th, as the British entered Bekwai's southernmost exurb, Eginasi, one of Wolseley's officers almost immediately encountered a local man who had caught wind of Nkwanta's plans. The man spilled the beans on everything for a 20-pound bribe. So, as the British advanced into Bekwai, they were not only aware that an attack was coming, but exactly where the attack would come from. Despite this advanced knowledge, one patrol of Ashanti scouts still managed to get the drop on a British unit that strayed too far from the rest of the army. They shot and killed three British soldiers, including, importantly, an officer. A few hours later, the British advance guard was marching in the forest near Aganasi when they were suddenly beset by an intense Ashanti firing line. Using the assembly line reloading technique invented by Nkwanta, the Ashanti were able to bombard the British with shocking intensity. The gunfire was so intense that nearby trees were stripped entirely of their bark by flying bullets. The British advance guard was primarily composed of Scottish troops, and according to one eyewitness, the gunfire at Eginasi was so intense that for the first time in his life, he couldn't hear the bagpipes being played during battle. As the British soldiers dove to take cover in the grass, the Ashanti began climbing trees to get a better angle of fire. After a few hours of exchanging deadly gunfire, the beleaguered British on the verge of retreat were joined by reinforcements. A group of Hausa mercenaries, carrying rocket artillery, fired their rockets into the Ashanti lines. The Ashanti scrambled to recover from the shocking blasts, but were soon met by a British bayonet charge. However, Ashanti plans had not been dashed just yet. In fact, you could argue that everything was going exactly as Nkwanta had planned. The Ashanti strategy had never been to stop the British at Eginasi, but to lure them deeper into Ashantiman and eventually isolate them from their supply lines and reinforcements. If the Ashanti were to lure the British into their ambush, they would have to put up convincing resistance before. After the battle at Eganasi, the British continued advancing down the road, into a rural neighborhood on the western outskirts of Bekwai, known as Amalfo. When the British column reached Amalfo on January the 30th, Nkwanta sprung his trap. Two Ashanti columns, one led by Aman Kwasha, who was desperate to redeem himself, maneuvered quickly around the British lines. They attacked and scattered the British rear guard, encircling their enemies. Realizing that he'd been surrounded, the commander of the British forward guard dug into defensive positions, hoping that he and his men could outlast the Ashanti assault. The surrounding British took heavy casualties at first, especially their 42nd Division, which was almost destroyed entirely. Wolseley would later estimate that for every four soldiers present at Amofo, one was either killed or grievously wounded. However, after several hours of enduring heavy and devastating gunfire, the besieged British soldiers began noticing that many of the projectiles coming from the Ashanti lines were not bullets at all. With ammunition supplies desperately low, 
Ashanti soldiers began to shoot anything they could get their hands on at the British, including cowries, small stones, and nails. At one point, the captain in charge of the British forward guard was himself shot with a nail head in the thoracic cavity. The captain was incapacitated, but survived the wound despite the grievous nature of his injury. Had it been an actual bullet that struck him, his death would have been a near certainty. With the Ashanti running severely short of ammunition, the remaining three quarters of the British forward guard managed to survive the assault. Meanwhile, reinforcements arrived. The Ashanti wings began suffering attacks from the British 2nd West India Company. Due to the lack of ammunition, the Ashanti were sitting ducks, and the result was devastating. The West India Company eventually broke through the Ashanti lines and bailed out the forward guard. Meanwhile, the Ashanti army was forced to bail in the chaotic retreat. The army's wings, overextended and essentially unarmed, were massacred. At one point, in a desperate attempt to turn the tide, Amun Kwasha himself stood up on a chair to shout to his men and bolstered their morale. A stray bullet hit him in the chest, and he was killed. The king of the city of Mampong was also struck down in battle, marking the first time in history that a foreign enemy had killed a member of the Kotoko Council since the foundation of the Ashanti Empire. According to his secretary, despite the victory, Wolseley was incredibly unhappy after the conclusion of the Battle of Amafo. Although his army had won the day, he was well aware that their victory was a stroke of good fortune. The secretary records that Wolseley himself angrily remarked that, had the Ashanti had even just a little more ammunition, the entire invasion force would have surely been eliminated at Amafo. Additionally, the heroes of this battle for the British was the West Indian Regiment, composed of Afro-Caribbean soldiers so the virulently racist Wolseley was hesitant to give them any credit for the success of his campaign. The badly beaten Ashanti army tried to rally, aiming to slow the British advance until a defense for the capital city could be prepared. They destroyed roads, usually by felling trees to clog the path, while also ambushing British supply depots in a desperate attempt to siphon needed ammunition. These attacks usually failed, and the British continued to advance, albeit at a slower pace. By the afternoon of February 1st, Wolseley's central column reached Kumasi. There was no defense ready, and Cockery, and Quanta, and the majority of the city's populations abandoned the city and fled north. As the British marched into the Ashanti capital, they were taken aback by what they saw. While British people had seen Kumasi before, only Wolseley himself had actually read any of these accounts from earlier visitors. The average British soldier, having been fed stories of Ashanti savagery and backwardness, were shocked by the scale, organization, and even beauty of the city they marched into. They were impressed by the multitude of two, three, or even four-story houses, the city's sewage system, the intricately decorated foundations of its buildings, and its well-maintained roads. And that was just the residential areas. When they reached the royal palace, they encountered the central treasure trove of the Ashanti Empire. The most precious items, including those crafted by Ashanti hands, looted from their vanquished enemies, or bestowed upon them as tributes or diplomatic gifts. The palace was an architectural treasure in its own right. Constructed of a mud concrete covered with a whitewashed facade, the palace consisted of a three-story rectangular building, with two smaller rectangular extensions jutting out from its width, and another extension at the top forming a small fourth floor. Its roof featured a walkable patio, featuring thick guardrails, while the ground floor was lined with vestibules, each prominently displaying decorative treasures. Inside the palace, British soldiers found gold masks, each weighing around 40 ounces, depicting animals and humans alike. They found stools covered with silver, the sacred swords of the state and dynasty, as well as golden and silver sculptures of calabashes, melons, and yams. Gifts from foreign emissaries, including precious silk textiles, Persian rugs, artistic glassworks, portraits of many famous Ashanti nobles, princes, kings, and queens, and even a sword engraved with a personal message from the British Queen Victoria herself. Most shockingly, there was the library. The Ashanti Palace Library featured multiple shelves of books. Now, we have no idea what these books were, as they only appear to be briefly mentioned in the written summaries of some British soldiers' observation of the palace. The only consistent detail in these descriptions is that the books were written in multiple languages, and that British newspapers were also found throughout the library. However, we can make some guesses as to at least what some of these books were. Most notably, there is some pretty substantial evidence that the Ashanti city of Mampong was an important stop in the larger trans-Saharan trade of books from around West and North Africa, including manuscripts written by Hausa, Fulbe, Mande, Jolof, and other West African people, as well as Amazigh, Arab, and European writers from the North. Additionally, earlier accounts of visitors to the Ashanti Empire confirmed the existence of a large literate class of predominantly Muslim people living throughout the empire, 
including many in the city of Kumasi, and that many of these literate Muslim advisors worked directly for the Ashantahane himself. So it would make sense that at least some of these books were written or read by these Muslim advisors. General and Quanta's actions also evidence that at least some of these books were Islamic literature. After all, he had provided his soldiers with copies of Quranic verses. How could he have done this if there weren't copies of the Quran present in Ashantiman? Given the presence of British newspapers, some of these books might have also been of British origin and traded for on the coast. Maybe some of the books were diplomatic gifts. There also exist accounts of earlier visitors that evidence the use of adinkra, the Akan system of pictographic pseudo-writing, being used as a form of bureaucratic communication. There are no existing artifacts that feature adinkra being used in long-form writing like a book, because that's not really what this symbology is designed for, but who knows? Stranger things have happened. Maybe some of the books compiled and recorded these bureaucratic orders. This is purely conjecture though, and sadly, we'll never really know for sure because of what happened next. Now that his troops had entered the city of Kumasi, Wolseley demanded that Kakari officially meet with him to negotiate the Ashanti surrender. Kakari sent messengers to stall, saying that he was like totally on his way and he'd be there soon. But after weeks passed, the Ashantahane never seemed to show up. The general accused Kakari of stalling, trying to force the British to stay until the wet season, when the intense rains would slow down the British supply lines and leave them stranded. Not to mention, while Wolseley's column had emerged victorious, the other two columns had experienced more challenges. I hope you didn't forget, but Wolseley's army wasn't the only invasion force passing through Ashantemon. Two more British armies marched northwest, aiming to converge with Wolseley at the Ashanti capital. However, partway through their trek, they encountered a brick wall. Remember that well-equipped force commanded by the king of Joaben? Well, remember that they had returned to Joaben when the government decided to back Nkwanta's strategy rather than the one that the Joaben Hene favored. Well, those two other British invasion forces had tried to pass through Joaben and got badly defeated by Aji's waiting army. Most of their men abandoned them after this defeat, and the remaining troops slowly trudged towards Kumasi only by taking a longer route to avoid Aji's army. So if he could get this war over with faster, Wolseley was reducing the risk that this column gets caught by an Ashanti army. Now, we know from Wolseley's personal writings that he had always intended to destroy much of Kumasi, but Kakari's stalling gave him the perfect excuse. Wolseley put Kumasi to the torch. Every historically or politically significant building in Kumasi was looted of its valuables and set ablaze. The Abandan, the duplicate castle emulating Elmina, built by Osebonso to practice sieges, was destroyed with explosives. The royal mausoleum, the home of every important bureaucrat, the city market, the Juaben embassy, the royal temple, execution square, the Ashante Manchamu meeting house, public baths, and the most beautiful street of old Kumasi, the famous Hayasafo street, were all burnt to the ground. Most tragically, the crown jewel of the Ashanti empire, the royal palace, was stripped of everything that the British could carry. The British army had looted so many valuables that they simply didn't have the capacity to carry it all back with them to Cape Coast. The palace was blown up with explosives, and then its ruined heap set ablaze. The items that the British did haul back were sold to merchants on the coast for a fraction of their value, and most ended up becoming lost to time as a result. Some items, like a gold face mask, were sent back to Britain, where they eventually ended up in the Royal Museum. Finally, two items, a golden orb meant to be held by the Ashantahane during ceremonies, and one of the Ashantahane's many crowns were taken by Wolseley himself. He would keep the crown as a family heirloom, while giving the royal orb to his infant daughter to play with as a rattler. In the end, as the British army marched back to Cape Coast just in time to avoid the wet season, they left Komasi a smoldering heap. Humiliated, Cockery finally agreed to sue for peace. In a document that would come to be known as the Treaty of Fomena, he agreed to pay the British an indemnity of 50,000 ounces of gold, recognize the British claim over Almina, release their overlordship over Achiam and Danchira, and end the ritualistic execution of criminals. With this agreement, the Third Anglo-Shanti War formally concluded in February of 1874. The casualties suffered by British allies like the Hausa and Fanti, on the other hand, are completely unknown. So too are Ashanti casualties. In all three of these categories, they were likely quite high. In terms of Ashanti history, the conclusion of the Third Anglo-Ashanti War is by far the darkest era. There had never been, and would never again be, a military defeat half as humiliating or devastating as this one for the rest of Ashanti history. Not even close. Just seven years after the conclusion of the Empire's impressive renaissance under Kwako Joa, 
the empire was both literally and figuratively in ruins. How could this happen? How did the Ashanti fall so fast from an utterly unstoppable, invincible empire to a state whose army was scattered and its capital in ashes? Well, from our observations of this war, there are a few things that changed about Britain that really shifted the balance of power between themselves and the Ashanti. For starters, Britain, as well as the rest of Western Europe and the United States, was at the time undergoing a massive economic, social, and technological shift. Now, I could dedicate, like, an entire podcast to this, so I'll keep it absurdly short. Known as the Second Industrial Revolution, the period from roughly 1866 until 1900 saw rapid advancements in mechanical and chemical technology, and social changes that allowed for more efficient production and transportation of goods. Notably for the Anglo-Ashanti War, this increased the capacity of British factories to produce absolutely unimaginable amounts of gunpowder, ammunition, and weapons. Perhaps even more important was the widespread dispersal and improvement of coal-powered shipping. Using these combustion-powered ships, the British could rapidly and reliably ship massive amounts of food, weaponry, medicine, and reinforcements in West Africa. This might not sound very exciting, but as the apocryphal Omar Bradley quote goes, amateurs study tactics, professionals study logistics. And to really emphasize just how big the logistical gap here was, an examination and comparison of British colonial records and Ashanti accounts indicate that, during the Third Anglo-Ashanti War, a single storage warehouse in Cape Coast possessed more powder and ammunition than the entirety of the Ashanti Empire. Again, one warehouse, of multiple that existed, I might add, than the entire Ashanti Empire. That is a gargantuan logistical gap. Historical accounts have made a great deal over the disparity of military technology between the Ashanti and the British, noting the greater accuracy of British rifles over Ashanti muskets. But it is worth noting two things. For starters, the Ashanti had the knowledge and capability to manufacture relatively modern rifles, and a solid fraction of their army possessed rifles made in the 1840s at the start of the war. The re-emergence of older muskets, including, most infamously, models of muskets used by the French at the Battle of Waterloo, was an example of the Ashanti army reverting to older models due to a desperate shortage of firearms, not a lack of knowledge regarding better models. Additionally, even with this disadvantage in firepower, we still saw the Ashanti perform quite well in several stages of the war. At the Battle of Amafo in particular, what stopped the Ashanti from destroying the encircled British was not the inferiority of their firearms or the failure of their tactics, but a shortage of ammunition. Now, why the Ashanti didn't experience industrialization in the same way as Western Europe is like something you could write a whole podcast or even book on, and that many people have written whole books on. Some commonly listed factors include that the largely enslaved Ashanti labor force wasn't really a good fit for industrial mass manufacturing, that the cheaper availability of European industrial imports encouraged slower growth of local competitive manufacturing, that the self-reliant nature of Ashanti rural economies dissuaded the development of a mass consumer economy, the lack of easily accessible fossil fuel resources, and much, much more than that. But even with these disadvantages, the Third Anglo-Ashanti War was still on the constant brink of devolving into a bigger insamanko. While Amafo eventually went down in history as the worst defeat in Ashanti history, it was very close to becoming the worst defeat that the British would ever face in Africa. Had the British forward guard collapsed under slightly heavier Ashanti pressure, the entire British campaign would have almost certainly been undone. Had the well-supplied and high-morale troops of Aji been present at Amafo, this almost certainly would have been sufficient. It had managed to defeat a British army in a much more equitable tactical position, so it follows that it probably would have done the same at Amafo. So, had Aji remained with the main army, or had Cockery possessed the clout and power to make him stay, history likely would have gone much differently. Not to mention, Kofi Cockery had come to power by purging the military of talented officers and cutting taxes. These decisions indisputably weakened the Ashanti military, so, if they had not occurred, maybe things would have turned out differently. This isn't an alternate history podcast, so normally I don't bother with questions about what if this or what if that, but I think it's really important to highlight in this case. If the Battle of Amafo shows us anything, it's that the fall of the Ashanti Empire, as well as European colonialism that would eventually follow, were not inevitable tides of history. Like everything else, had these things gone just a little bit differently, the world would not be the same as it is today. So, keep that in mind as we chart the slow and sad decline of the once proud Ashanti Empire for the rest of this season. This was not inevitable, it's just how it happened.
the Jwabenhene didn't move south, Kakari did purge the military, and Wolseley did burn Komasi. That is the world we live in. So, what happened next? Well, the answer for the Ashanti Empire is nothing good. Thoroughly humiliated by his epic defeat, Kakari will face an internal challenge like few Ashantihanes had ever faced before. Join us next episode when, for the first time in a century, an Ashanti king is formally impeached and removed from power. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then we would love it if you could support the show. You can do this through supporting us monetarily at patreon.com slash historyofafrica, providing the show with a rating or a view on whichever platform you listen on, or sharing the show with anyone who you think might be interested in learning more about African history. This episode, like all others, is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Naomi Kanakia, Ayo Fagbamie, Morgan Blackmore, Sarah Mpenza, Tobias Tunglin, Dimitri, Emmanuel Zaudi, Alexander Travis, BB Milliam, Conrad Schwenke, Travis Bell, Johnny Knowles, Ose Kwame, Lucia Plesha, Godfrey Sebelabie, and Diz RH, among others. Thank you all for supporting the show. It really means a lot. Oh, and speaking in Patreon, myself and the editor Justin are putting together a new series of bonus episodes. In this show, tentatively titled the Patreon Chiamu, Justin and I will chat about some of the behind-the-scenes elements of the show. Yes, hi, it's me, Justin. You've never heard my voice, but I've been the one editing the show for the last several episodes. If you're interested in hearing me and Andy talk casually about our experience editing, researching, or writing for the show, this is the place to go. Yeah, we've got lots of cool stuff there, ranging from deep looks into the sources for the episode, or just talking about our personal reactions to the content of the latest episode, or any other stuff related to the main show, bonus shows, or just updates in our personal lives. To listen to these special shows, just support us on Patreon for $5 a month or more. See you there. It's gonna be pretty sweet.